Welcome to the Regional Broadband Technical Assistance Workshop. Thank you for attending today. Over the last year, we have seen how essential robust broadband services are, whether you are a parent, an educator, an employer, or an employee, business owner, or a consumer. The Georgia Broadband Availability Map has shown us that more than a million Georgians lack access to reliable high-speed internet. During the pandemic, in order to protect the health as well as the safety of others, many of us have been working from home and educating through remote learning and utilizing many other online services. Those that have internet access has tra transitioned seamlessly, but those without access to internet connectivity have struggled. In response to this disparity, we are seeing funding opportunities for broadband infrastructure from federal and state and local governments. I am Dana Perry, the Executive Director of the Broadband Office at the Department of Community Affairs. The purpose of this workshop is to outline the tools and resources available to communities as you consider specific projects to provide services to unserved areas. The mission of the Georgia Broadband Program is to promote the deployment of broadband services to unserved areas of the state. The number one barrier is providing high speed internet to rural Georgia is cost. Because of population density and terrain, it is difficult to find a business model that will justify the build out without additional resources. That is why partnerships are key in finding solutions. What does partnering with the private sector ISP bring to the table? Expertise in designing, building, operating, and maintaining a broadband network, as well as capital. Local communities will play an essential role in solving this important issue. Why? Local governments can bring additional resources that can close cost barrier gaps and advocate for where connectivity is needed for unserved homes and businesses. The GBDI team has been developing tools and augmenting resources to support public private partnerships. The development of these tools and resources has been a coordinated effort across multiple state agencies that represents the work over the last couple of years of the project team that also includes the broadband advisory committee. As you can see, we have multiple state agencies that are working together as well as a, a very robust advisory committee. Department of Community Affairs and Georgia Technology Authority has led this effort in partnership um, in coordination and collaboration with the Department of Transportation, State Properties Commission, Georgia Department of Economic Development, and certainly with the support of CVIOG at the University of Georgia. Our advisory committee consists of um, ACCG representing community county interest, at and Comcast, Georgia EMCs, the Georgia Municipal, Asso Municipal Association that represents cities, Georgia Cable Association, Windstream, and the De Georgia Telecom Association, as well as the Georgia Economic Development Association. The core team will be presenting today. The panelists are myself, Dana Perry, uh, Bill Price, IT strategist from Georgia Technology Authority, and Eric McRae from CVIOG ITOS. GTA has been project lead um, in helping us with expertise and leading the uh, mapping project, as well as um, Eric uh, with it, Carl Benson. Today, we'll talk about the different resources that we have developed across the team. We'll talk about the mapping, we'll talk about project planning, and then finally, we'll talk about the state grant program. There are a lot of broadband funds available, including a state grant program, which is why it's important that everyone be smart about why, how, and with whom we invest these public resources. Our purpose today is to outline these tools and resources available to communities as you consider specific projects to provide services to unserved areas. As I mentioned um, today, we'll talk about the resources and tools. Um, we'll talk about uh, mapping and how to identify unserved locations. We will talk about um, technology options, uh, also project investment, and how to identif identify and qualify partners. CVIOG's ITOS team led by Eric McRae has been a vital resource in the development of these tools, especially in developing the Georgia broadband availability map and utilization of the map data. So now I'll hand it off to Eric, who will walk us through these resources. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Dina. So the first thing we need to understand is why did we go down this path of mapping differently than how the federal government does their broadband map? When the federal government maps their data using a system which is known as Form 477, 
they request that all providers provide them any census blocks where they have at least one serviceable location in the census block. If they have a single serviceable location in the census block, the census block is considered to be served. In this example that we see here, all of the green dots are considered to be served. All the red dots are unserved. In this example, this census block would be considered to be served by the federal standards. It's important to note if there was just one single location here served, this entire census block would be served. Georgia is taking a different approach to this. In Georgia, when we look at this data, we say if there's 80% or more of the locations served, then that census block is served. And what do we mean by served? What is broadband? Well, Georgia has defined broadband as being a minimum 25 megs down and three megs up. So in this example, this is considered to be an unserved census block per Georgia's standard. There's more than 20% unserved locations in this census block that cannot subscribe. Hence, the census block becomes unserved. So just using this methodology, quickly we can see that we have a completely different view of what the state of Georgia looks like. In the, in the, the map on the left, which is the FCC map, the orange or darker color are considered to be served areas. The, bay, the yellow or mustard color, the lighter color is considered to be unserved areas. We're using the same color scheme in the state map, but you can see there are very large areas of the state that have become unserved using the methodology that we're using. And to use this methodology, we're having to get down to a very granular level. We're having to get down to the address level, the location. And in this case, we were able to tell definitively after we had mapped it in the first year in 2020, that we had five, over 507,000 locations, homes and businesses, which were unserved. 70% of unserved Georgia um, locations are rural. So 70% of that 507,000 are in rural Georgia. That doesn't mean 70% of Georgia is uh, unserved. 31% of rural Georgia is unserved. We have 26 counties that have greater than 50% of their locations is being unserved. As part of developing the Georgia Broadband Deployment Initiative, we developed a website broadbandgeorgia.gov, which gives you access to all sorts of resources, including maps. I'm going to walk through the different maps that are available on the website. So the first map is GBI unserved by county. On this map, you can select a county, and when you select the county, it'll give you the, the statistics for that county. In Jasper County, we, which we have selected, we have a total of 4,601 unserved locations. There are 20. 2,710 served locations. That means that the percent unserved in Jasper County is 63%. We can also zoom in, and when we do, we can get down to the census block level. When we select that census block, we can get information such as the census block ID, the census year, um, which county it's in, the regional commission, the congressional districts, house districts, senate districts, and the number of served locations and unserved locations in that census block, and then the percent unserved for that census block. So you can really get a lot of information by zooming in on these maps. We also have a map that's called GBDI Unserved Georgia, which gives you the ability to do the same types of functions that you have in the previous map, but you also have the additional ability to do things like turn on layers, such as which uh, Senate district it is, which House district it is, and then you can also run a query by selecting the query button with a little magnifying glass. Once you've done this, you can then select how you want to zoom into this data. So we can say, well, I want to find it by a Senate district, and if I select that, I will then get a query box that I can then fill out. I can go through, select that, I select this Georgia Senate District 53, I hit apply, now I have the results for Georgia Senate District 53. I see that there are 5,642 unserved locations and 77,382 served locations, making that this Senate district is actually only 7% unserved, which is actually very good. That's better than the state average. On this map, I can still zoom in and I can select an individual census block if I desire. We also have a comparison map. 
the FCC versus GBDI broadband comparison. By using the slider bar pointed out here, I can slide this bar across the map. And when I do, I can see the difference between Georgia and the FCC. You can see here there's a stark difference between Georgia and the FCC. And I can compare that as I slide that uh, backwards and forwards. I can zoom in if I want to look at an individual area and see that in, in more detail. We also have available all of the map data. That map data is, includes a uh, web mapping service, which allows you to just embed this information, this data into your maps. If you're using things like ArcGIS Online or Leaflet or anything like that, you can just pull these services in and use them directly. We also have the data as a CSV file, which will list out the census block and then all the pertinent statistics that are involved with that census block. If you would just want to look at this in a spreadsheet style. We also have the data as a shape file. So if you want to download this data and pull it into your own GIS, you can do um, as you please with it. Um, we do ask that you fill out a little survey to give us information about how you might be using that data. It just helps inform us when we're making decisions as to what information to make available to the, the greater public. I'm now going to turn it over to Bill Price, who will go through some of the uh, benefits of working with the GVDI team. Thank you, Eric. Uh, it's good to be here today and wanted to talk a little bit about uh, investing in broadband infrastructure. Uh, and one of the key things is in ba basically aligning investment of different funding resources. We're at a unique moment in time where funding is becoming available um, to federal programs, to state and local governments that can be used to expand broadband service availability. The team um, that you know Dina and Eric and I are part of, we've been evaluating what our options are to align and maximize the impact of various funding resources <clears throat> as they come online this year. And we've developed these tools and resources to inform the decision making process to figure out, you know, what's the best way to maximize the funds as they become available. Broadband infrastructure has relied on private company investment historically in the free market where there really isn't uh, where there is competition and typically new project investments to expand or upgrade are determined by short term revenue and return on investment potential against the investment risk and competing priorities for limited capital to broadband providers. In Georgia, broadband infrastructure has mostly evolved from telecommunications and cable companies. Uh, in Georgia, there's 44 current retail ISP provider investors. Uh, there are some local governments who are in the business of providing internet services to citizens. Uh, there are a few electric co-ops that are already uh, in the market providing retail broadband service. Um, and there's a new set of companies, uh, mostly EMC uh, partnerships uh, that have been awarded uh, funds from a federal program that we're talking about here in a minute that are also coming into the market. So one of these funding source programs is what's known as RDOF. That stands for the Rural Digital Opportunities Fund. It's run by the FCC. Uh, part of what we do uh, at the state broadband team is we track federal programs that are run by the FCC, um, RDOF, Connect America Fund, the USDA Reconnect program, and others that come along like at NTIA. The RDOF program has so far announced a few months ago that they're awarding a uh, support funding to companies uh, to serve 179,455 of our unserved locations. And even so, that still leaves us with 328,000 that remain unserved with 25 meg down, 3 meg up broadband service or faster service. Um, and that is what the state GBDI grant program will be targeted towards. Um, the RDOF awarded areas, I believe, will be not eligible for state grant funds. Um, we're part of the State Broadband Leaders Network, where we share lessons learned and tools and information and best practices. Um, we provide information and guidance to federal agencies about broadband mapping and uh, other things. And so we continue to track uh, the federal funding programs coming out of the FCC. We're watching RDOF closely because they haven't made their final decisions on uh, the awards and who will get them. So they're in a due diligence phase called the long form phase. So if we look closer at 
RDOF and its potential impact to the state of Georgia. There are 15 companies. We, we know who they are. We know where they've been awarded. We know how many locations they have. Uh, over 10 years, um, you know, if it all plays out the way it, it might, uh, they'll get $326 million to serve all these locations. And what you can see in this slide, the table shows the big ones, which is the rural electric co-ops who were awarded um, with 60,000 locations and Windstream got a large number of locations, Charter Cable and Starlink, which is a new um, Elon Musk um, satellite entrant um, and the service is called Starlink <clears throat> from SpaceX. Um, and like I said, they're in the middle of the long form review where they're evaluating all the technical specifications and plans of these companies. They're investigating their financials and some may drop off. Uh, actually, some locations may be removed, so we're gonna have to pay very close attention to this uh, to see what the uh, long-term final effect is. The good news about RDOF in Georgia <clears throat> is that the awardees have proposed predominantly fiber to the home or hybrid fiber coax, which will allow them to provide gigabit service or faster. Um, the baseline, which is around 50 meg down, is really Starlink, which, you know, covers, you know, a scattered, you can see in the, it's hard to even see the blue, but it's scattered throughout. And the other thing about RDOF is that they do allow up to six years for the companies uh, to reach 100% of service availability to the awarded locations, although we believe that some of them will want to complete their projects faster within three years. Um, in the Federal Connect America Fund, we did see um, aggressive build outs to, because they don't get access to the funds until they complete the build out to the location. So they get the funding by location as they report in that they've completed the build out. So we're gonna be watching that closely. We're evaluating what can state government do um, to ensure they're successful and help them accelerate their deployment timeline. So back looking at investing money in broadband infrastructure and understanding that a little bit, uh, this illustration breaks it up into, you know, its fundamental components. So if you think about the internet as like the interstate system, the middle mile is like state roads, the last mile is like county and city roads, and of course the location is the driveway, right? And all of that requires cable, and electronics to um, turn on the signal. And when you look at, we've run cost models, uh, investing in broadband, um, we've done it for fiber to the home, we've done it for fixed wireless. And if you you know look at the cost model, what you see is that the lion's share of capital cost is in the last mile electronics and plant. Um, there is uh, middle mile uh, components to support the aggregation of uh, customer bandwidth needs that, you know, they have to make sure they have enough capacity. Uh, so there is some impact there, but the lion's share of it is in the last mile, which is what, you know, we're, you know, focused at least at the state grant level on investing in and what we're seeing in the guidance coming out of treasury for the ARP funds, the American recovery funds that local government will have access to. Their focus seems to be also uh, on capital costs and in the last mile. <clears throat> so it's it's important to understand this. So this slide, what we're illustrating here is that we all uh, will be looking at um, how much does government contribute to the overall cost, capital cost, um, and what's the provider expectations? What do we expect providers to come forward with in the state grant program? Uh, the state is willing to fund up to 50% of the capital um, and when you think about the, all the costs, the operating costs and the capital costs, the provider is really coming up with, you know, over 77% of the total cost because they're bearing all the operating expense plus 50% of the capital. Um, and it, in our cost model analysis, you know, we've seen where, uh, you know, locations can represent low capital cost or medium or high capital costs. And in the medium and high capital costs, we may have to vary uh, the contribution amount that, you know, government funding is available in order to encourage the private sector to pitch in their part of the contribution to actually get them built out. But at the end of the day, you know, getting, you know, government or providers, you know, making investment in a proposed project, it really is about, you know, meeting the expectations of both investing parties. And of course, private sector companies look for a shorter term 
uh, break even return on investment, um, but there is one, you know, three to five years out. Um, government tends to look, take a longer term view um, and, you know, be willing to take a uh, longer risk, you know, to reach break even. But it's important that we try and find the right balance, you know, because you've got to figure out in any project, basically, what's the business case, what's the pro forma, you know, how many ex paying customers do you expect to acquire over time versus the cost, and that's going to give you a return on investment and when you go cash flow positive. So each project that we evaluate at the state level, or I would say even at the local government level, is you've got to identify these fundamental expectations. How many locations are you proposing to build to? What's the speed, which will drive the speed chosen, will impact the capital cost? Um, and what's the contribution factor that each party is willing to bring forward? We've got to look at balancing the risk and the reward <clears throat> and sustainability. Um, is the project financially viable and sustainable? And if it is, then it will achieve cost, cost recovery. Um, it will have working capital, so the system's got to be able to maintain enough working capital so that it can be upgraded as you add more customers and have a positive cash flow within an expected time period. So as Eric has been talking about and Dina, um, they've been developing mapping tools and a lot of data, and it's really been geared towards supporting um, applicants, local government, um, and providers to jointly make informed uh, decisions about, uh, you know, if we pick an area and it has this many unserved locations, um, you know, can we make this work financially for us? Um, and so to effectively and efficiently plan projects out, um, we're hoping that the data, would, you know, that's been built and made it going to be made available will help, um, you know, applicants to understand that and with working better with providers um, so that at the end of the day, if an award is made, uh, it has a higher degree of uh, success rather than failure because nobody wants failures. Um, so understanding the basic network fundamentals and how that affects, you know, the capital cost and the major cost drivers, understanding what the major risks are important for applicants and providers who partner, um, understanding where are all the potential subscriber locations, residential and business, by census block, in county, uh, down to the location of the structure themselves is important. All this is information and data that we will be making available. You know, we as the team, I think it's been stated that, you know, we've got information, a great deal of information about qualified providers who are potential um, partners and applicants. Um, and we hopefully will have identified where they're interested in making investments and partnering up. Um, the state has uh, been working to um, create contract vehicles that will make it easier and faster for local government applicants to engage with providers. Uh, we, we also have data about who has received previous program funding awards from the Connect America Fund, the RDOF Fund, and the USDA ReConnect. So we'll continue to monitor the federal funding sources and uh, hopefully be able to provide, you know, local government applicants with a great deal of helpful information. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. Funding broadband has been a top priority for both the governor and the general assembly. Uh, the state has appropriated 20 million in the amended year of FY21 and an additional 10 million for FY22. So with the combined years, we have a total of 30 million that'll be available um, for grant programs to the, one, to the one Georgia eligible communities. The state broadband grants are designed to encourage broadband investment in unserved areas of the state. Public financial support is made available in the form of competitive grants for projects that deploy quality high-speed internet service. These grants are intended to defray the cost of capital investment funding such activities as installation and expansion of required facilities and equipment. The program is designed on three principles. Maximize the number of unserved locations or served locations, maximize public investment, minimize risk. It is governed by the One Georgia program, so it is much like other infrastructure construction projects. However, the design, build, and operations of a broadband network is very complex and needs expertise. Key differences in broadband infrastructure projects versus other One Georgia infrastructure 
is the need to partner with a qualified provider and also identifying the specific unserved areas that are eligible for funding. So today we'll talk about how you, who may apply, how you select a provider partner, how do you determine an eligible geographic area, the funding, how much funding is avail available, the match requirement, and the evaluation criteria for the applications. So who may apply? Eligible local governments and authorities who have partnered with a qualified broadband provider may apply for funds, which will be awarded through a competitive process. Qualified providers can be selected two ways, one through the approved provider list, two through a local procurement process. So the approved provider list we will be publishing at the end of the RFP process, and it will have a list of qualified providers that a local government may, government may select from so that they can begin the design um, and develop the agreements and the partnerships uh, so that they, they can begin the development of the project. Or you can also um, use your local procurement process, which um, has to be a local bidding process, competitive bid process, following your procurement guidelines. As mentioned earlier, public-private partnerships are key to bring the most cost-effective solutions in investing public funds. The GBDI has resources and data to identify potential qualified providers. They bring expertise, as I mentioned earlier, in design, the build, the operate, and maintaining, which leads to maximizing investment and reducing risk. Bill mentioned a couple of things that are key when we in selecting these providers and where they are in proximity to unserved areas, how they can edge out their networks. When applying for state's funds, we expect that the applicant to partner with a broadband service provider, selecting them from, as I mentioned, an approved provider list or through a local, local procurement process. Service provider partners can bring to the project existing assets or infrastructure that they can leverage as well as financial and operational capabilities to support the customer. Service providers who are receiving federal investment may, be, may have an interest in partnering with projects that are located near the service area and are eligible for state funds. As I mentioned earlier, um, a combined total of 30 million will, will be available. Uh, the 20, 20 million appropriated in 21 uh, this year, amended budget, 10 million in Y22. The match requirement, the state will fund, will contribute no more than 50% of the total project cost, and those projects that best leverage state funds will receive most favorable consideration. The broadband grant program will provide up to 50% of capital requirements for a project, which requires at least 50% of a capital contribution from other sources, including service provider partners. Greater match contribution will receive favorable application scoring. So the match can come from both the provider or a local match. Um, the expectation is, is that the provider would bring the majority of the match, but locals, they too can contribute in, which will also enhance uh, the competitiveness of the application. Any unserved census block as determined by the Georgia availability map that is located in an eligible or conditionally eligible one Georgia county not already included in a USDA or an RDOF funding is eligible to be included in a grant application. Grants will be competitively awarded and only those unserved locations within the unserved census block will receive funding. As Eric mentioned earlier, the broadband mapping team is developing a grant eligibility map tool to assist applicants in identifying proposed project areas. So as I, as I mentioned, um, and as Bill mentioned, um, we have been tracking where other federal in investment um, is being made in the state. Um, so we have that information and that data. Um, and the way we're utilizing that with the Georgia availability map is overlaying that so that we can identify the census blocks that remain unserved. Those that remain unserved are those that, that will be eligible for state funds. The intent here is, is to maximize. As I mentioned earlier, our mission is really to um, reach unserved Georgians. So we want to expand on those. If you have, if there's been federal investment in census blocks, 
um, we want to invest state dollars in those areas that would continue to be unserved without federal dollars. You've seen these maps earlier and throughout, and it's important to, to familiarize yourself with these maps. This is going to be the tool in which um, an applicant would go to in order to identify their proposed unserved area. As you can see, the blue represents an unserved census block that would be eligible for funding. The number within that census block um, is the number of locations that are unserved. Um, so this is the first look of the uh, grant eligibility map. This tool will be available on our website um, once the, the tool is um, interactive and has been launched on the website, which we will be making <clears throat> communities aware of when that tool becomes available. The lighter um, blue area or bluish green area is an illustration of uh, additional tools within the grant eligibility map um, where you can use a lasso tool to identify specifically what service area you are proposing to serve. So this is an illustration of a potential service area and how you would identify it on the map. You would do a screenshot of that download it for an upload of, a, uh, of an application. The eligibility map will be key in your pre-app. Uh, Pre-apps will be um, a mandatory and the eligibility tool will be where you'll want to identify um, your proposed service area and use that information for, a, for the pre-app period. In addition to the lasso where you can identify it, um, uh, the census blocks, you will also have the ability to download uh, a CSV file, a spreadsheet with a census block ID number, the county, and the number of unserved locations. Uh, that will be part of the requirement um, in identifying your proposed service area, and that too will be part of the pre-app and uh, part of the documentation that you will want to upload in the pre-app in order to illustrate um, where you're proposing your uh, service area. Part of the evaluation criteria is the broadband ready community designation. Uh, many communities have applied. Um, the intent of this is to um, demonstrate the willingness of a community who has taken an effort um, at a grass grassroots level and has stakeholders and the community involved in supporting uh, the need for the build out of, of services to unserved areas. Um, the two requirements um, is adopting a model ordinance. The intent of the model ordinance is to streamline uh, permitting processes and to uh, uh, cap the cost of applying for the uh, applying for those permitting. Also, it's important to include a broadband service element in your comprehensive plan. Um, both of these will demonstrate that the community uh, is reducing the obstacles and is promoting planning and is um, seeking partners uh, to build out to the unserved area. Those can be applied for on our uh, broadband.georgia.gov website. There is a um, tab that will say designations, as you can see on the screen. Click there and it'll provide you with the information of, of how to apply. We have 17 um, communities that have been designated we currently have four that are being uh, that have applied and are being reviewed. Um, so we continue to to have applications for these designations. Again, um, the requirements to become a designated community, um, you must apply on our website, and you must um, have uh, an updated comprehensive plan and adopted a model ordinance. The as I mentioned, you can find these resources on our website. There is a model ordinance template that you can follow uh, for the adoption of and meeting all the requirements for that model ordinance. So the evaluation uh, criteria for the grant programs um, captures really two components. One is impacts and outcomes and the other sustainability and feasibility. But as I mentioned, you know, we are trying to our mission is to uh, reach the unserved. So number of locations is important identifying maximizing the number of locations that the project will reach. Um, again, that is um, done through our availability map and uh, identifying those service areas. Selecting a qualified provider partner is part of the evaluation criteria. 
project capital cost. Um, as we've mentioned, we believe in partnering. Uh, this will bring down the cost. You can maximize your inv investment um, and be good stewards of public money. Um, if you have a provider who has existing infrastructure that can be leveraged, uh, the expectations is those costs to develop those projects would be lower than a um, working with a provider that doesn't have any existing assets or any existing infrastructure in the area. So project capital cost will be key. It'll be evaluated against the Greenfield model. Um, as I mentioned earlier, capital contribution is also key. Um, the minimum requirement of capital contribution or match is 50%, but if uh, there's more contribution that is contributed, uh, that will that will enhance the application um, and make the application more competitive. And finally, the community preparedness, which is the uh, broadband ready designation. So while the broadband ready de designation is not required to apply for state funds, and I want to repeat that because we've had a lot of questions, it is not required in order to apply for state funds. It is part of the evaluation criteria, so there are uh, priority consideration given to those um, that have the broadband ready designation. One other thing to mention um, is that the maximum amount that you can apply for is $2 million for a, for a single project, which if you come in at a minimal match of 50%, that total, pro total eligible project cost would be around $4 million. So how do you apply? Um, so DCA um, is creating an online portal and it will be available on our website. Um, information will come out in our NOFA. Uh, the, there will be a pre-app and then a full app window. We will be releasing the NOFA the first part of June, um, which will have um, more details um, about the full app and the pre-app and how you, how you apply. We anticipate accepting applications um, mid-summer. So just on a final note, as you consider broadband infrastructure projects, regardless of the funding sources, also consider utilizing the broadband resources to guide investment decisions that maximize taxpayer dollars. So as I mentioned, um, upcoming events, we'll be launching the Georgia eligibility map. We will be releasing the NOFA. Uh, first part of June. Um, we'll also, around that same time, hold a grant program workshop that will get into the details of how you how you apply on DCA's website and how you use uh, the online portal for those applications. For assistance, um, local governments can contact a uh, con contact us at local governments support for the designations. You can talk, contact Brittany Hickam and Map Inquires you can contact Jason Sale. Um, for any additional questions, you may also connect, contact Brittany or Jason or myself. Thank you.